Living Room Logic. Welcome to Living Room Logic, a place for you to chill out and have a laugh with two scientists who know too much about very, very little. I think that we should all have stayed in the ocean, and Andrew thinks that big brains don't tell the whole story. This episode, we talk about the origins of modern humans, how important it was that scientists found a single pinky bone in a Siberian cave, and how we got down and dirty with other hominin species, then murdered them all. Be a tool to our tribe and follow the podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. If you enjoyed what you hear, maybe leave a review or tell a friend. Come find us on Instagram or Twitter or other social media that just has too many ads. Sit back and enjoy this evolving experience. Welcome to the second last episode in this season for Living Room Logic. (laughs) It's okay. We'll only be crying if this is a complete failure and we won't be coming back. (laughs) So it'll give everyone a reason to celebrate for one reason or another. (laughs) So this week, what we kind of want to talk about is the evolution of humans. So we want to go from, you know, what separates us from the apes. And the way we're going to do that is actually look at our common ancestor. And we're going to say, right, this is the point from which... Uh, chimps went one direction and humans went the other and we're going to follow the lineage down of each of our ancestors along the human line compare them back to us now and to what chimps are like and to kind of say these are the differences that were happening and hopefully at the end end up at the human race in Mm -hmm. in some capacity or skinny naked chimps yeah well only naked at 3 a.m. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, uh, so yeah, we're going to crack into that. And Aiden is going to start us off by talking about that common ancestor. Yeah, as I said, we're just tall, skinny, naked chimps. But I guess our whole lineage did start uh, and broke apart away from the modern chimpanzee about 7 million years ago. And at that point in time... We had our common ancestor, which is uh, the closest one we know is called uh, a species called Sahelanthropus. And I'm sure that doesn't ring a bell because no one bloody knows what the hell that is. Fair play if it does. (laughs) Yeah, well done to you (laughs) if you do. But this uh, Sahelanthropus is basically very chimp-like, very Mm ape-like. And Mm. you... If you saw it today, you would almost not be able to discern whether that it was any different from a a modern chimpanzee, really. Um, Maybe other than just things like size. But, you know, the idea is that this common ancestor lived in Africa. And it was actually the the fossils were found in Chad, which is in uh, Central Africa. And so these dudes were tree dwelling. They were hopping around on trees, having the time of their life, okay? And they had a really small brain. Uh, But actually, just like chimpanzees in modern day, they had the ability to every now and again go down to the forest floor and stand on their two legs. But this is only for very short periods of time. And mostly, you know, today chimpanzees do it for uh, signs of dominance. They'll stand up really tall and they'll Mm. stick their hands out and bang their chest and stuff like that. Mm, That's cool. And nothing... Crazily interesting happens for another two million years in human evolution. You find more and more that over the next two million years that these Sahelanthropists, they diverge into these species that, uh, you know, use the ground a little bit more, but they're still this tree-like species. And actually, we have a really good fossil record for this species, or at least we have a sev- uh, several kind of really good specimens. And there's a little dude called Ardi that um, they found in Ethiopia. And uh, it was, again, more like a chimpanzee than it was like a human. Um, and But it actually uh, runs from this ge- genus, uh, this group of species called Ardipithecus. And they were around, in again, in Africa um, between five million years and two and a half million years ago. So they lived for two and a half million years. So that's actually, again, kind of a crazy amount of time. When you compare it to humans, we've only been around for, say, a couple of hundred thousand years. So, mm, um, yeah, wow. You must give it to these little dudes, right? But uh, the thing is that they were actually able to climb, but they could also walk bipedally. And they were, 
you know the fossils show that they their feet were less like a chimps and that they had the ability to grasp onto branches and stuff but it was much smaller so you could tell that they're like literally half in the trees and half down on the ground uh, walking around having the crack and um thing is is that their brain size gets a tiny bit bigger from this uh, Sahelanthropus um, it's still about I don't know it's something like uh, eight or nine times smaller than the size of our brain so still really mm. really small brained kind of monkey like creatures and uh, the kind of interesting thing about this one was that actually we look at the males and compare them to the females and we look at their teeth their dentition is what it's called and you actually find that they don't have these really big canines that um, other monkeys tend to have and other chimpanzees and, and that whole lineage. And the reason that those chimpanzees have larger canines is uh, signs of dominance and things okay. like aggression. And it's not just in males, like um, in some species um, in modern day, uh, females are uh, dominant and they have super large canines and it's just a sign of alpha. It's a, oh, cool. it's a it's a it's a display mechanism so they oh, kind of awesome. show off their fangs um kind of like a dog um, and yeah, yeah. and it's really cool and and so what you can take from that is that these ardy dudes were less aggressive than chimps and they were actually kind of they were more they invested more time into things like parental care which is really cool and we oh. actually find as well that they have a a sort of omnivorous diet uh, those first dudes, the Sahelanthropus, seven million years ago, they were just eating like berries and stuff and maybe, you know, maybe insects, like maybe stuff like that. But it's just really easy stuff hanging from trees. They're hanging out yeah. up in the trees. These dudes are kind of getting a little bit more experimental and they're eating some more meat and stuff. And the, the way that you can find this, like how, how paleontologists and paleoanthropologists is what they're called, um, find this is they actually like, they find fossilized teeth and they grind off, um, it's called cal- calculus, which is really weird. I don't know why it's called calculus. Okay. But it's just the sedimentation of food around their teeth. Okay. When we eat food and we don't brush our teeth, if you never brushed your teeth in your whole life, you'd have this kind of layer of gross stuff between your gum and your te- tooth. And it oh, would delightful. fossilize if you are if you become fossilized in mud or whatever. And yes, yeah, so they, they looked that up and they actually looked at that stuff under the microscope and they can find what it actually was that they ate whether it was a piece of a plant or a piece of an animal or whatever so pretty cool what i will say about the the next dude and the the guy i was just chatting about ardy is that before you get into the kind of homo genus and they're called australopithecines and so they're kind of like they're they're those primitive humans um Mm. you wouldn't really call them humans it's just like they're somewhere in between monkeys and humans right okay so let's maybe jump forward i said that already starts about and evolves at about five million years ago let's jump to four million years ago now you have these dudes called australopithecus okay Mm -hmm. and they live again for nearly two million years so they live from four to two million years so again quite they're quite successful in time compared to us they have this kind of long legacy like two million (laughs) years is actually a long time for a hominin species yeah for sure so again, weirdly, these guys are only in Africa. So all of these early kind of divergent um, species from our kind of last common ancestor with chimps are all in Africa. And yeah. again, this th- these guys are really weird because these are the first species to be fully bipedal. Okay. And, okay. And so they have evolved these long... Uh, slender legs like us large hips but then it's really weird because their upper half is still really monkey like and they have like these really long arms and they just have this like <laughs> stick out rib cage they just look kind of <laughs> like they look like a fella in a pub who's just like been there for way too many years you know what I mean <laughs> and like so so these dudes um, Australopithecus there's a, an amazing there's an amazing fossil of this and it, it was quite famous when it came out it was called Lucy and it was a, a small female uh, Australopithecus. And I think she was about, I think she was like three and a half foot tall or four foot tall. And these guys only got about four and a half foot tall. So they were pretty small. And and so the males were a bit larger than the females. But again, you know, the point is that they basically, they completely move away from 
the forest environment maybe in central africa or in the rift valley there in near like ethiopia in um, central eastern africa which was like really really productive at the time would have been kind of like a, a rainforest scenario yeah yeah the, that kind of dries up you know more and more and you find that you get more arid conditions and they kind of move up they're kind of forcibly removed from those and they they are over time evolved to move into kind of tall grass savannas right so there's actually this awesome fossil it's in tanzania and it's called uh, the Laetoli footprints. The awesome thing about this was that, first of all, they found some fossils of the Australopithecus close enough okay. to this. And cool. it, so it dates to the same time. They can build the whole body from the footprints, which is amazing. So huh? based, on the, based on the weight distribution of the feet, you can kind of guess the weight of the animal and then... And then based on all of the evidence around these footprints and the other findings of fossils and stuff, you can build that. Who made that footprint? And it's crazy. That's crazy. The, the idea was that this Australopithecus, uh, you know, um, Lucy, uh, her, her species, is there's a big volcanic eruption in Tanzania, okay? And the whole landscape is peppered in volcanic ash, right? And imagine it as if... They're kind of they're kind of scared and they're so they're probably leaving and they're walking away and actually you can tell from the footprints that the weight distribution is a little off and so based on the weight you could tell it was a female but the weight distribution was slightly more on the left side of the feet so you can imagine that the female was carrying something and they could actually calculate that the weight was that of like a young child oh so my god you can imagine that one of these things they were like in a maybe in a family group and the mother was carrying her child through this kind of vo volcanic ash field and like walking away from it like and they were moving on uh, it's just so wow. cool that what they can base off of such well i guess like that's not the only evidence that they got but yeah, they saw those footprints an amazing amount of information to get from just like these <laughs> I'd walk past some footprints and I'd be like, yeah, they're probably dinosaur. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you Jurassic Park would be interested. So oh, that's my God. Really it it makes me think of, like, you know, like the uh, people who put their hands and their feet and stuff into concrete when it's laid down. Mm -hmm. Like, there is definitely a few paleontologists out there who could be, like, forensics on these footprints and handprints and be like, I can figure out who that is, size this and this foot, this heavy, likely male, you know. Yeah, I <laughs> this, know, but, well, that's kind of interesting that you say that, because it really is. Uh, I, I did a class back during my undergrad in, in NUI Galway and, and on this, and it was like, I remember now that my lecturer was at the time was saying it was just as if, it was just perfect environment. It was like, it was raining after it happened. It was like light rain and the footprints were cemented. They were, they were basically cemented. And then, uh, I think they were covered with a mudslide and then that just perfectly preserved them. Wow. You have to have these perfect conditions for things like that to happen. Yeah. But yeah, really interesting. And so, you know, from here on out, our storyline kind of goes past these, these earlier uh, kind of hominin animals and we move into more human-like uh, species. Yeah. All of the different species and animals that Aiden mentioned, they're, they're the start of the line of humans, but they're not quite humans. They, we haven't gotten to the point where we can say, you know, that is the early human. That is so close to us that it is. So we need to kind of ask the question of what exactly is a human? What what actually defines that line, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, these paleontologists have kind of come up with a few different things that they use. They identify the size of the brain, okay? So naturally, they want to find these primates with bigger brains than usual, right? Mm -hmm. They want to find a similar arm-to-leg proportion that humans have, right? So if you think of, like, the ch chimpanzees, if they stand upright, their arms go down past their knees, yeah. Long, long arms. They're hella whilst, long. Yeah, whilst if you do the same thing, that's different, but fair play to you. You know? It's, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So it, it's... it's get, yeah, it's it's getting the same proportions. 
The next one, right, which I think is quite cool, is language, which, you know, it's not like you can go back and interview them and see what happens when you stick a microphone in their face. <laughs> they, they, you know, it, it's How a rock. How did that make you feel? Yeah, <laughs> you hold the and microphone to a little bone or something in the, in the yeah. mud. Mm, not much. But right, <laughs> so what they can do is that in our brain, we have a certain area which is responsible for language. And this is on like the, uh, you can say, the left and right side of the brain on the sides uh, in the temporal lobe, right? And this is called the Broca area. And based on looking at the skull, they should be able to find a little indent in where the brain would lie. And if they have this indent where this Broca area would be, they say, right, they must have had a developed language center. Well, like, so we have that, like we have that indentation in our brain. Some more than others, but yeah. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> no, we do, we don't. do, we do, we do, <laughs> we do. Yeah, everyone has that. Yeah. Ah, oh, so cool. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, so like, uh, you can see that in all. Like, if you look inside of a skull, which if you ever do, I hope you didn't make that happen. Um, <laughs> you'll actually, me. yeah, you'll actually see that it's not like a, it's not like a little circle. It's not like a sphere. It's not smooth. It has loads of little indents and certain different things. And some indents are so arteries can run through them. And oh, okay. other uh, other indents are to make space for different brain regions. And this is just one of them. You have a little indent on the inside surface of the skull mm -hmm. where this Broca area would be, which I think is really cool. Um, another interesting thing to how to define these humans is that there's actually a gene responsible for developing this called the fox p2 gene so in any of these samples like bone samples or any anything they can find uh if they can get any dna from it they can check for the presence of this gene and wow. if you if you have this gene it means that you could have developed a language center because our fox 2 gene activates in the womb to develop this center Mm -hmm. in our brain so it, it's just so it's a kind of cool way to you know we can't stick the microphone in their face but we can get pretty good evidence that uh they might have used language and i'm not saying that you had like these chimps five million years ago complaining to each other over deliveries i'm saying that <laughs> they they could communicate to each other in some kind of some sort of some way you know they, they yeah exactly there was a like, there was a vocabulary of sounds yeah, exactly. Like yeah. a little more complex than birds, uh, not as common as we would speak today, right? Yeah. And the the last thing that makes th that makes a human human is the use of tools, which we've had. A, we did a whole podcast on on how we, you know, use use things outside of ourselves to promote ourselves, and mm -hmm. that's something that separates humans from other animals, right? They use that in defining what a human is, but it is probably important to keep in mind that. If you give a chimpanzee a rock, he'll use it to crack a nut. So it's not yeah. something that's explicitly human, but it is something we look for. So if you were looking back and you found any of these uh, species, and next to them you found an arrowhead, or you found a particularly sharp rock, or something like that, people could you could make an assumption that, oh, maybe they use tools, you know, if it wasn't a naturally formed rock. Yeah. So So that brings us to... The controversial furthest back ancestor of the human species, of the human genus, the homos, okay? Yeah. And this is Homo habilis, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so this was, this, the first fossil of this, right, was discovered also in Tanzania uh, in 1960 by a science couple, right? Uh, Mary and Lu Louis Leakey. And... It was their son who found this, named Jonathan, and the name of this fossil was Johnny's Child. That's oh. what they, yeah, that's what they called it. But they, they found it and started looking at it and they were going, this is new, this is fresh, we haven't found this before, right? And more and more evidence kept popping up for these Homo habilis. So th they were around roughly 2.3 to 1.6 million years ago. They were present in both South and East Africa. So we, you know, moved from Central Africa to different regions. They were about one meter tall. They had larger brains than the um, Australopithecus, yeah. which Aiden was talking about. So they were bigger, but 
they weren't big enough to be considered human. So keep to, to can be considered a human relative. So keep that in mind as we go on. Yeah. They they also had long arms, and they had a protruding face similar to a chimpanzee. So you know how the chimpanzee face has a flat forehead and the mouth comes out. So it yeah. had a similar similar build like that. One thing that people got really excited about the Homo habilis was was because it was found with the presence that it used tools. Okay, so it was the furthest back fossil that was that showed it was found with loads of different rocks, loads of different things that it was using to like sharpen sticks. It was sharpening rocks. It was sh- f- loads of fossils were found with like this treasure chest of weaponry and this treasure chest of different things it was using. Yeah. So Homo habilis, when you actually translate it, it roughly translates to handyman, actually. Which is kind of a bit, a bit, a bit punny to the fact that it was first using <laughs> using tools. I'm a big fan of that. Um, and uh, but it's a, it, see, it's a really interesting creature, right? And um, similar, so it lived in small groups. Uh, so it wasn't like the human species in a massive way. It was much more similar. Again, it was still very close to chimpanzees, gorillas that, you know, you, they'd have a tribe and there'd be a small group that would live together, a family. Yeah. And they were omnivores. OK, so they kind of ate whatever they could get their hands on. They mm-hmm. were they were just fresh off of the fresh out of the trees and they were just about getting on land and trying not to be killed by giant other animals that were. <laughs> you know, grazing on the savannah mm-hmm. all those millions of years ago. But it, it is interesting because there, there's a there's loads of discussion around the Homo habilis because they're not sure if it's an, if it's enough to be human mm-hmm. because it has it has tools. And, you know, humans love identifying themselves as uh, intelligent. Uh, Homo sapien in Latin means wise men and it, a lot of people say uh, Homo sapien sapien to define the current state of the species, which is literally calling us wise, wise men. We're very uh, anthropocentric. We like looking at the whole thing from our perspective. Yeah, not only that, but also looking at it and saying, hey, we're great. That creature showed some greatness. We're related. I like it. You know, yeah. so uh, the biggest driver for this is the fact that it used tools. Okay. It doesn't ha- it doesn't have the right arm to leg proportions. It does have some evidence that it had language, right? So it had some of these indentations for la- language in the skull and it had tools. So it's missing the arm leg proportion and it's just shy off the brain size. So its brain was about two thirds below what they kind of say is the limit for considering it related to humans. But it'll still it'd still like it still fix the plumbing under your sink like. I don't know, man. It's still, <laughs> you know, with its rocks, it would come in screaming at you. Yeah, <laughs> just, it comes on harp on the door with the stone too. It just starts oh, screaming, starts screaming at you and you just throw 50 euro at it. And you're like, what in there now? Sort out oh, the fucking sink, will you? <laughs> but like, yeah, so Homo habilis, that's kind of the the controversial member of the homo species, of the mm-hmm. me- of the age of of humans on Earth. The next species that really made a huge leap and the first one we can really say is very much so like the humans today uh, is this species called Homo erectus and it's the first species to leave Africa. So the rest of all of those early hominin species and Homo habilis, they all just chilling in Africa, just super happy out, either in their their jungle or in their savannah they're just chilling but homo erectus is like nah (laughs) and there's like some there's some awesome fossil evidence for homo erectus in that it was just this extremely muscular species very lean and thin um they could be about six foot tall you know they they looked a lot like a modern day marathon runner 
if you picture those people like they're just incredibly they've really lean muscles and they can just run for miles that's what yeah. your uh, your homo erectus would look like and and every single one of them so they're just incredibly athletic but you know they're a little bit on the dumb dumb side so <laughs> they just had a slightly well not slightly smaller brain case their their brain case was about uh, 800 centimeters cube but what that means is it's about half the size of a human brain yeah, but it's still over the limit for being considered brain. Yeah, they dumb yeah, dumb, it, but they can run. They they dumb dumb, but they can run. So like the limit, the limit is six hundred. The limit is six hundred. Yeah. The Homo habilis was four fifty, and what was the Homo erectus? Uh, Eight hundred. Okay. Yeah. So they are definitely over this, but it's amazing because the species, you know, it. it it was the first species to go out of uh, Africa. They they first evolved about two million years ago, and they only became extinct a hundred thousand. Sorry, yeah, a hundred thousand years ago. So wow. they were again. These species kind of ruled the most of uh, pretty much what is known as Africa and Eurasia, which is from Europe to Asia and pretty much right down to like the Pacific Islands. Wow. Um, in, you know, there were spe specimens found in Java, which is like a feckin' island way off the coast of, uh, in, in the Pacific Islands. How did okay. they get there? How did they get there? <laughs> so, um, but the thing is about these guys, you know, so there's the first evidence of using fire. And mm. now, very contentious, every time they found fire that they just kept it going. Um, so, you know paleontologists mm. don't really know whether it was a thing that they actually knew how to make fire but there is evidence of them using fires to their advantage not very mm. often but enough to to see patterns um they definitely hunted game so they're these are one of the first species to definitely go out in coordinated in a coordinated fashion and hunt game and and large animals and and so you get this partitioning of the men go out hunting the game the large risky animals and then the mm. females will do kind of foraging of insects uh uh fruits vegetables grasses stuff like that so you start getting this kind of hunter gatherer type human but they kind of looked a little bit different from us in their skull and their face so i said their brain case was much smaller but they had this kind of they still had this large brow and we'll talk yeah. about that more with the next couple of species but they kind of you know you definitely would see that they look different and i'm pretty sure that when homo erectus engaged because they were around when humans evolved and when that happened i think there would have always been contention and there would have always been like a f <laughs> fighting it out you know i yeah. don't think it was a thing that i don't think homo erectus was evolved enough to kind of coexist with other human species yeah. or hominin species what we do know as well is that they they did gather in these kind of coordinated groups they had these kind of say a uh, size of about 20 people in a group um and as well there is this amazing evidence they found this homo erectus skull and it had no teeth, but they found out that the teeth had fallen off that individual, an old individual, years and years before it died. So it's like, how did that person survive without the other people in their kind of group or, or tribe chewing their food for them? Yeah. So they would chew their food for them and maybe spit it out and give it to them in their hand or something like that. And they would just like gnaw on it. But it's better than being dead. So like a... <laughs> there's there's this idea that, you know, there's this group mentality and this uh, mm. this empathy and this compassion within the group. You don't really see that in, in the earlier species, you know. And there's also, so there's there's some really early evidence of them doing very primitive versions of art not even cave drawings nothing like that it's just on certain bones and things that say from something they killed sometimes you know so to take off the meat they would use these things to scrape the meat but what they found was that on on other parts of the bones they would actually kind of draw these like concentric or symmetric shape uh pictures almost but not they wouldn't resemble something they would just be this kind of it's almost like you know, Homo erectus Joe is just after killing a big boar and he's like after gnawing off its leg and it's happy out and he's happy out. And then he just like 
decides to draw this doodly thing on the leg, you know? It, it, it's just like this, they, they, they definitely had that cognitive ability to, yeah. to maybe think of things that are not in our objective reality. But, um, you know, their brains were still um, kind of dumb dumb. They actually have the kind of next tier up of tools from Homo habilis and they use these things, they're called Aculean stone tools. And it's just that they were much sharper and they would use them kind of like axes, like a hand axe. So you would use, mm. it's just a stone, but it's extremely sharp and you could uh, turn them into things like picks, knives and cleavers. So they're, they're kind of diversifying their tools. But the... The interesting thing about Homo erectus is they take over all of Europe and Africa pretty much and and Asia, but they actually never improve their tools. So they're around for nearly two million years and they just they're just still using these hand axes and they're running around naked because they don't they have they don't have that cognitive ability to, to make clothes. So you know, you can imagine why they they became extinct, um, you know, or maybe why they were easy to kind of uh, eradicate uh, from the other hominin species that evolved later. And so when Homo erectus is in Asia, another later hominin species evolves and the species is known as the Denisovan. So the Denisovans were kind of as these uh, hominin species moved out of africa right so we kind of had the the triple divide so some stayed in africa mm -hmm. some went to europe and some went towards asia and uh eurasia towards australia and the the the, the, the denisovans were the subgroup that went east okay mm -hmm. so we had some of these uh these hominins that stayed in Africa, some of these hominins that went to Europe, and yeah. some of these hominins that went to Asia, that went to Malaysia, Southeast Asia, that went to the Australias, right? Yeah. And the thing that makes the Denisovans quite interesting is that we know almost nothing about them. Okay? <laughs> almost nothing. Okay? The first evidence, right, of this entirely different species that came about was because they were looking in a cave in Russia called the Denisovan Cave. Mm -hmm. And they found a piece of a pinky bone. Okay, a piece of, like a pinky bone, like one of, one of the little things in your pinky. And they were like, hmm, that's <laughs> weird. And, you know, they're good, but they're not that good. So they couldn't t tell if this was a completely different thing. So yeah. what they did was they they dug into the bone to see if they could get a little bit of DNA out, and they did. Mm -hmm. They actually did. And when they did that, they did they took the genome and they were like, "Huh, this isn't anything we recognize. Mm -hmm. This is definitely not a Neanderthal. This is definitely not any other animal who'd have this bone. This doesn't make sense. Like they they knew it was a it was similar to a hominin, but mm -hmm. they it, it wasn't quite close. So they they kept looking in the cave, right, and they found then some molars. Okay. And it was quite funny because when they found the molars, the molars were like the teeth, the molars at the back of your mouth. When they found them, it was huge. Like these big ass teeth. So like think of your molar but just double it in size. Like it just huge. And they saw that and they were like, oh my god, the Denisovans were giants. They must have been giants because they just proportioned everything up until the teeth fit. Uh, yeah. But the, but later evidence kind of, they were like, oh, well, more than likely they just had a really wide mouth. Okay, so mm -hmm. they just had a really huge jaw. So that's interesting, right? For chomping. For chomping. And again, when they found, they dug into the molar and they were able to get more more information and they could then like start tracking all of the information from the Denisovans and everything they did. So there's a few really cool things that, that are in the human race just because of them, right? Some really cool things. Okay. So 
the the people of Tibet, right, on the Tibetan plateaus, yeah. they they have variants in their genes that allow them to regulate how much oxygen is in their blood because they're at such a high altitude. They they need to take in more oxygen than the average person. If me or you went up to those altitudes, wow. we'd str- struggle for breath, right? But they have that, and in That's these, really cool. de- yeah, it's really cool. And in these Denisovan DNA samples, they found that trait. So they're saying that this subspecies is where that came from. Another one is in the Inuits. Okay. So the Inuits, which is a a, a native group in the North Americas, they have another variant in their genes, which increases the amount of brown fat their body produces. So in your body, you have two different kinds of fat and brown fat proves to be a better insulator from the cold. Okay, so, and that is also in this DNA. Mm -hmm. This DNA presence is really big in, like, Indonesia, for example, and people around Melanesia, around Indonesia, they could have 4 to 8% of this DNA. Humans today still carrying this DNA. It's really, really interesting, right? Wow. And the most interesting thing, thing that I found that I thought was worth mentioning, which Aiden's about to touch on, uh, talking about Neanderthals, <laughs> was that they found a little baby and they called it Denny. And this, when they looked at Denny's DNA, Denny was born and grew up as exactly a 50-50 Neanderthal Denizen. Mama was one, Papa was the other, oh, and so this cool. baby came about. Yeah, and little Denny, and it just completely blew people's minds. But it's again, the, yeah. It's crazy. But the thing is, is there's so few fossils. There are so, so few fossils. So, like, it's mostly just, like, that pinky bone, loads of teeth. Uh, Most of the information they know about it came from that cave. They recently found another cave in Tibet uh, or, uh, yeah, and in caves in China where they're finding more and more. Mm-hmm. But like these were some pretty uh pretty strong dudes like they didn't go extinct until about 15,000 years ago. You know, that's really recent. We're 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 making strides yeah. here and the Denisovans they were sturdy. They definitely put up a fight. Cuz when did they first of all you said again you said it was uh, 400,000 years ago, right? About that, yeah. Mm-hmm. So it, it was around that split the same time that the Neanderthals left Africa. It's just mm-hmm. They went one way and the Neanderthals went the other. You just put the Himalayas between them and it's just like, yeah, there you go. That's so cool. You get a common ancestor and you just pop their common ancestors on two different continents. You leave them for a million years and see what happens. And they'll, they're going to look totally different in a million years time. Yeah. And so there's hundreds of thousands of years there where Neanderthals are in Europe and Denisovans are in, in Asia. And and both of them are, there's a section there in like near Siberia, mm. in the Baltic area where their ge- geographical distribution is overlapping. Yeah. And, and that's amazing that they could still interbreed. And it's something that it still confuses me to this day. <laughs> and, I, and, and, you know, I don't think anyone's figured it out is what finally stops two species from interbreeding. And, and if two species can interbreed, then are they actually diff- two different species? And yeah. I think maybe that's kind of going away from this conversation, but I just think it's a really important thing to to think about. You know what? We'll have a hot take about that in about 20 minutes if you yeah, keep listening. Yeah, let's, let's hit that at the end. We'll, let's get back to that and just be completely clueless about it. You guys are going to enjoy that. So let's, yeah, let's kind of touch on Neanderthals a bit more. So again, 400,000 years ago, um, the early kind of Homo erectus had already taken over Eurasia and now there's these Denisovans in Eurasia as well and there's actually a cu- couple of different species of, of hominin and I'll, I'll touch on maybe one more after the Neanderthals but there's a couple of species of hominin kicking around and Homo erectus is kind of like the, the biggest dum-dum of them all and the poor <laughs> dude is just kind of slowly losing um, because the, the fecker doesn't know how to put a jacket on and the rest of them do. So the, the Neanderthals are are kind of one of the first species 
to start wearing clothes. They were living in during ice ages, but in between ice ages, they needed to to kind of adapt to those colder temperatures, right? Mm-hmm. Especially up towards, you know, you can even find them up in northern Germany and up towards Scandinavia. So they they had an amazing range there in Europe and towards Siberia. They looked quite different again to humans and quite similar to the Denisovans in that they were kind of, they had really stocky, uh, really stocky build. They were probably about a foot smaller. They were all about five and a half foot tall. It was the, the kind of maximum uh, height. Um, but like their faces look totally different. They had this massive brow ridge. Their skull like stuck out from their brow. Their frontal lobe was really small compared to humans. Mm. We can kind of go into that a little bit later in terms of how that was kind of advantageous to Homo sapiens. But that frontal lobe was really small, but that uh, the the kind of back of the brain was was kind of elongated. Mm. And so weirdly though their brain case was huge and actually their brain case was i think it was about 200 centimeters cubed bigger than humans so their brain case was bigger than humans on average which is kind of weird you know you know people think that neanderthals were dumb and the reality is that they definitely were not and in fact i think maybe their huge brain was possibly the one of their greatest downfalls um and and their huge size and their weight they were like these incredibly strong yeah. hominin species they were probably the strongest that had ever existed mm. and these guys used to take on massive game using spears they yeah. used to actually Just, go yeah. hand-to-hand combat with the, <laughs> with the mammoth <laughs> like that's something that homo sapiens never did and yeah. and homo sapiens would use kind of long range weapons yeah. and stuff and they would use the topography as in like the the landscape to their advantage and they would corral them down these uh, down these canyons and they would have people on either side and it would be very strategic the Neanderthals would just be like oh, and they'd just like go at them with these spears and just a couple of them would die and they would just get this massive win and it'd be yeah. humongously risky um, but that's just the way that they lived you when you think of that you kind of think of these massively brutish creatures but they weren't they were they had first of all there's lots of evidence that they buried their dead and now whether they buried their dead because the dude that just died by the mammoth was kind of stinking up the place so they just buried him a couple of meters away <laughs> you know they, there is that kind of just logical reason to bury someone there was some forms of art and spirituality yeah. that was coming into the Neanderthals. They did a little bit of cave painting. They they, they actually built jewellery out of like things that they killed. So there were like these necklace pieces um, wow. from falcon talons. And there was like holes kind of drilled into them using like a little bone drill. Wow. And, and so there were little holes in it that you would imagine that they would put like some twine in and wrap it around their neck or whatever. There's some cool stuff to bring the Neanderthals back to Galway in Ireland, where, where I'm from, um, and Andrew. The person who named the Neanderthal was a researcher in uh, the university in Galway. His name wow. was um, William B. King. And he, he was the first guy that looked at one of these kind of early human fossils. And he was like, Yes, I can say that this is not human. (laughs) (laughs) This is a thing called Homo neanderthalensis. And so he's the first guy that named the Neanderthal and he actually doesn't get a lot of um, recognition. So Mm. fair play to him. And in NUIG, we actually set up a whole section in the Natural Sciences Museum for him. So William B. King, God bless you. Ah, that's awesome, dude. Yeah. And so there's there's some there's some amazing evidence for Neanderthals down the, the very southern tip of Spain is a place called Gibraltar and, and maybe people know about it, maybe they don't. But there's this huge mountain range just at the the very southern tip and actually the British would have set up like an entire a fort line. But when they were setting up these forts, what they actually found were these caves because they would put the artillery ammunition in the caves and they were like, there's a bunch of tools in here and there's a bunch of skeletons in here and we don't know what to do with them and they actually got 
all the specimens and sent them all around the world and loads of different people again described the species as, as a lot of different things. Most people thought it was human and then William B. King said, you know what? Nah. That dude looks way different. He's a he's a he's a he's a Neanderthal. What we found was was from from those caves was actually that, you know, we found out a lot about them, and it's actually one of the biggest sites in the world, um, that that has these Neanderthal uh, specimens. So Neanderthals are bopping around in Europe. The Denisovans are and the Homo erectus are are kind of bopping around in in Asia, um, but back in Africa. And this is the weirdest thing, and this species was only founded very recently. This species was just founded there, I think it was, it's maybe just a couple of years, five years ago, something like that. Oh, right. Um, its name is Homo naledi, and it was found in a cave in South Africa. And they found that no cave has ever contained so many bones and like so much of a species and that we just never found before. And so there were wow. hundreds of these bones and they were just freaking out. These paleontologists were just like, you know, this doesn't happen in paleontology where you just find like a thousand bones and you're just like, you're set for the rest of your career, basically, those people. This species, they they, they dated it back to um, 300,000 years ago. So it's actually earlier than the Neanderthals. But here's the weird thing. Its lower half is very much so like a Homo sapien human-like feet, legs, hips, everything. It has very human-like hands. Its brain was tiny. And I, I think it was, again, it was down like uh, 1,200 cubic centimeters. So severely reduced compared to like humans, Neanderthals, Denisovans. And it kind of confuses the idea of the, the theory that as humans evolved, their brain cases got consistently larger. These guys actually mm. devolved in a sense, not not devolved, but their brains just got smaller. And and despite mm. this smaller brain size, and, and actually they, they, they found that the, the face was again ape-like. So the face looked ape-like again. But again, they were bipedal, they walked, they weren't in trees. And and actually their teeth and everything were were ape-like. So yeah. but when you look at the brain, that frontal lobe was large and those parts mm. that are indicative to things like tool use language and social behavior were enlarged but the rest of the brain was really small so was it dum dum i don't know it's really but it just it totally when they found this thing a couple of years ago they were just like well we're just gonna have to throw that whole our theory that we had the whole time out the window because it just doesn't make sense that these, the, this crazy. thing does not look like a human. If you looked at it, you would think again, ooh, maybe it looks a lot like that Homo habilis. But Homo yeah. habilis evolved millions of years ago and became extinct millions of years ago, whereas this dude only evolved 300,000 years ago back in Africa. And it, actually, the craziest thing is that Homo sapiens might have evolved before that thing evolved, which is amazing. Or, wow. or just very similarly to the time that Homo sapiens evolved. So, Andrew, this is when we come in. Homo sapiens are interesting creatures, right? A few really interesting things about them. We don't have much hair. We're lean. Yes, sir. We sweat. And we're not that strong. And we're hella smart. Mm -hmm. In... You know, in in, in comparison, terms. and the Homo sapiens species evolved around the same time, you know, as the Neanderthals, as these Denisovans, as everything mm -hmm. else, and it, it except it was evolving in Africa. Now, what's interesting is because this was all of evolution around the time of the Ice Age. So if you were up north, you know, you're experiencing a hell of a lot of cold. You're experiencing a lot of things uh, up north that are yeah. bad. Okay. So if you were up north, you need to get big, strong, bulky, you know, be able to retain lots of heat, be able to fight off all these wo woolly animals, <laughs> mammoths and rhinoceri that were coming yeah, after yeah. you. Right. But 
during the Ice Age, Africa didn't freeze over. Mm -hmm. It was a it was a different thing. It, it, it became drier, Weird. if anything. So these Homo sapiens began began evolving, and they real and it it just kind of was a, a benefit after benefit effect where they became smart. Uh, they learned how to make tools, mm -hmm. you know, you know, the same way they were they could make tools, but they were like we can make better yeah. tools. They their shoulders evolved and their body changed shape so they could throw things. Okay, which is a really interesting development because it sounds to us like the dumbest thing in the world, but we can throw things hard, like baseball pitchers, anything like that. Even people, uh, tennis players, uh, swinging their mm -hmm. arm overhead. Uh, uh, over yeah. their head, overhead. You can get so much power, and uh, this is something that we take for granted. And a big reason for that is because of, for one, the way our shoulder is made up, and for two the way our center of gravity is. Because if you see a chimpanzee and you imagine them, you know, reeling back to throw, yeah. their whole body is just going to plonk mm -hmm. forward because their center of mass is way too high. You know, they, they have not that big legs. They're mostly upper body, mostly arms. Whilst humans, we completely changed that. We actually moved our center of mass very far down and most of our muscles are actually in mm -hmm. our glutes. Like our glute is our biggest mm -hmm. muscle. And that leads me to my next point of... What made Homo sapiens excellent? Homo excellent. sapiens uh, during this dr during this dry age of Africa, they couldn't get much food. It was it was a bad time for them. They couldn't, you know, there wasn't much plant life growing because it was just getting drier, and they couldn't do anything like that. So they had to rely on hunting. But you know, similar to today, anything in Africa that you want to hunt, you're going to have to chase. So we developed these legs. And these bigger legs and our body mass went down and we became runners, is the theory that's going, right? That we were actually long distance runners. And what we do is there'd be all this prey that would sprint away to its safety and we would chase it. And it would sprint and we'd start jogging after it. And it would sprint like two kilometers away and we'd just keep jogging. And it would see us again and panic and sprint away and we'd keep on jogging. And eventually the animal would be completely run down. Just exhausted. Literally just, it can't do it anymore. Most animals, most prey animals, their defense mechanism is sprint. Use all your energy, save your life. But the Homo sapiens uh, developed to actually just keep on running. Other than like uh, pack dogs, there isn't animals with as much stanima as the Homo sapiens species mm -hmm. on Earth. You know, it's mostly just the uh, pack dogs can also do it. So this was hugely in our benefit because it meant we didn't have to hunt anything dangerous. We would just keep following an animal until it was exhausted. And then we'd lob a few spears at it at, from a safe distance and not die. And when you compare that to the Neanderthal methods of seeing a woolly rhinoceros or a woolly <laughs> mammoth or anything like that and grabbing their biggest club and just having a go... <laughs> You kind you you can kind of figure out why one way might be better. It just and, sounds so uh, crazy. They just sound it, it is. Like. But they could That's it. But like, they it, just couldn't swing. They couldn't swing a spear, so they were like, "I all I can do is the underarm." Yeah, they couldn't get their arms properly above their head to do a throwing movement, which is crazy. Uh, and even back to something you said, like they had their own things. Like you were saying that they had this huge brain mm -hmm. case, mm -hmm. right? So, the, you know, big skull, bigger than us. And people are like, oh, so they were smarter, right? But if you actually think to like, why do you have a skull? Well, you're protecting your brain. You know, your brain kind of runs everything. Okay, so... Regardless of the size of your brain, if you're the kind of creature that goes head to head against a woolly mm -hmm. mammoth, you probably want a really big yeah. skull. You know, thick. something massive, thick, and full of like padding to protect the brain as it's bopped around as you get charged at by God knows what creatures <laughs> were around During in the, the ice age. age. Like things things you know, weird. so like you <laughs> It could have been this itty bitty little brain bouncing around its li little cushion inside of the the dum dum Neanderthal yeah. skull, and the uh, Homo sapiens. So they they could run with their legs. They wouldn't overheat because they could sweat. They didn't need much food because they were a hungry species. 
right? They couldn't get food easily, so they were always hungry. And eventually they built a community style, right? So a, a big thing in evolution is that you are born a blank slate, you take in information, and then you die with that information. And a big thing that the Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens did was they had a community, right? So they weren't afraid of seeing other Homo sapiens. To the, it, there wasn't a huge aggressive style to them, right? But even look at Homo sapiens today. We don't have those fangs yeah. for dominance and all of that. We don't. It's, it's, we're different creatures. Mm-hmm. And Incredibly the thing about social. this is, is that if you, we're incredibly social and um, if one group of these Homo sapiens came across another one, they would share information. And this information would keep being shared and keep being mm. shared. And it and you can kind of see it now. We're, we're in an age of we're using information from thousands of years to continue moving us forward. And it was the same way with tools. Maybe one day there was this group of Homo sapiens who came across a, a lad who was just on his own. And he was like, I made this long stick with a pointy end and I keep throwing it at the tree and it gets stuck. Isn't that cool? And you were like, you know, it's this passing of, of information, right? <laughs> but then we kind of get to the thing of like, why did Homo sapiens beat the Neanderthals? And well, as the Ice Age ended, they needed to go north because there was nothing left in Africa. Africa got dry. Africa was, it was like, it was super bad. So they had to go north. And to, the thing is, is that the way they evolved to succeed, their climate just moved north. However, for the Denisovans and the Neanderthals, they had nowhere to go. They can't move north. They tried. They kept going to find their successful place, but they mm-hmm. couldn't. In the new climate, there wasn't enough food around to maintain their body. There, It was too hot for them in this new climate, so it wasn't ideal for them. Uh, all of the giant animals were becoming extinct. You know, like these woolly mammoths, like these big mammals that were that they used to hunt were also going extinct. So it was kind of a a big a big mix of all of these different things, you know? I think that's one of the biggest points of it, that it was like a series of unfortunate events <laughs> yeah. that led to the downfall of the all of the other species. But I think maybe the biggest one was our collective learning and that idea yeah for sure that every generation the generation before would pass on anything they knew and be like right remember mm. now this this and this and how did they do that through language and so yeah because of our complex language which at the time might have just been a couple of words or as you can string a couple of sentences of something together you know whether it was just vocalizations or whatever but it was the the idea that you could we could use words and we could create these these yeah. these sounds and these you know these complex sounds that comes out, come out of our mouths that are all to do with a, a particular thing so our our ability to throw and our ability to make these tools one of the most revolutionary tools was the thing called an atlatl you know those things that you can extend your arm uh, when you throw a tennis ball for your dog that is a very similar <laughs> idea of the atlatl in that it just it literally extended the length of their hand and and so the way that you f- fasten like a long dart into it and almost like a, an arrow basically and you you just extend it it just extends the yeah. the length of your arm which increases the speed of that thing uh, immensely and so you can throw things yeah. extremely far and they can you can have these coordinated hunting events where you can scare game into a certain place and then you can just fire these things down into a valley at it or you can push animals off of cliffs and you can you know all of these things and, and not to mention that humans used fire ex- like very very frequently and that generational knowledge was passed on yeah um collectively so it wasn't just Mm -hmm. you know it wasn't that information was was lost uh it was almost always gained and 
writing things and drawing paintings in caves and things like that, all of that was remembered by future generations. And I think that's one of the coolest things about humans and why they won. You know, an extremely yeah. cool thought is that apparently there was like nine different hominin species around at the same time uh, when humans kind of first evolved. And so you have humans leaving Africa. You know, oh, right. Homo erectus did it two million years ago, um, but humans are doing it again. Yeah. They start in Africa and then they leave Africa and they take over pretty much the whole place. And it's not just humans, it's humans, Neanderthals, Denisovans, Homo naledi, another one called Homo florensis, I'm pretty sure. Several other ones. And they're kind of like Homo naledi and that they have smaller brain sizes and they're kind of midway between chimp and human and they're all confused, yeah. Andrew. They're all very confused. But clearly, <laughs> Homo sapiens are the one with that extra bit of flair, strategic thought, ability to work in very large groups, non-aggressive I mean, Jesus, we're aggressive when we want to be, but in terms of our own species, very social and, <laughs> and can, can occupy very large groups. Mm. And kind of going back to what you were talking about with the Denisovans in that humans interbred with Denisovans, there's a lot of evidence that humans also interbred with Neanderthals and potentially with all the other species of hominin going on in Africa and in Eurasia and like that's an amazing thought to think that all these different species are running around riding but it's pro <laughs> <laughs> in our last episode with particle physics there was no love and in this one there's so much love in fact there's there probably no too much but no the, the, <laughs> there's some incredible <laughs> science behind this I, got, I actually got to meet this guy. His name is Svante Pabo. And I am almost certain that he won okay. a Nobel Prize. Uh, and the thing that he won a Nobel Prize for is uh, completing the genome for the Neanderthal. So we didn't actually explain what Whoa. genome is before. It's basically all of the, 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 the readout of your DNA all the, the, the different letters of your DNA and the positions that they're in. It's something like 32 billion lines of, of code, okay? Of genetic code. And uh, most people, uh, all humans have very similar, all of these 32 billion lines. Maybe a couple thousand are different, something yeah. like that. Um, and then you can compare, if you get genomes of other species, you can compare the relatedness of those 32 billion lines of information. And so what they did was that amazing thing to do with the Denisovans, they, they ground down a part of that little tiny end of the Denisovans pinky, which is like, how the hell did that pinky yeah. bone get there? And where the hell yeah. is the rest of the body? <laughs> He's just like, oh, my pinky. Yeah. And it's just, that's it. Like, he just like, his pinky fell off. Like, he 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 accidentally chopped his pinky off and then it oh. fell into a cave. Like, come on. What did you do, dude? Anyway, it's an incredibly complicated technique, but they can do it. And it's very, very scientifically, statistically robust. And it's an amazing feat. But yeah. what you can do is you can compare the genomes of Neanderthal bones, Denisovan bones, any other species if you if you want, once you have their genomes, and compare them to humans from around the world. So when you compare a human's genome yeah, yeah. from Europe to Neanderthals, it's 2% likeness. When you compare Neanderthals' genome to an African person, okay. someone who's from Africa now, generationally, there will be very low re relatedness in terms of their genomes, okay? Again, yeah, as yeah. you said, someone from Malaysia... Which makes sense. When you compare them to Denisovans, there's a 5% of their genome is Denisovan. And you said per particular yeah. genes are 50-60% 50, related so yeah. you can almost say look they were acquired from those yeah. things things like immunity 
um, of certain things, yeah. immune disease and stuff like that. And, yeah. and there's pros and cons to what we've gained and, and maybe what we gained in a bad way from, from Denisovans and Neanderthals. But just an amazing thing that, especially people with a European lineage, we are part Neanderthal. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but yeah. it's cool. It's a thing. And and it's just It's like, a thing. <laughs> what, you know, it, it makes me sad, actually, that all, all of the other species are extinct. And it only happened very recently. Like Neanderthals, when did they go extinct? 15,000 years ago? Yeah, and uh, Den- Denisovans so, were about thirty to 15,000 so years close. ago. So close, 15,000 years, like. Yeah. To think that, you know, you have ancient yeah. Egypt a couple of thousand years ago. And, yeah. And, and just jump another couple of thousand years and then there are these dudes running around. Yeah, you know, it, it it's crazy to think about. But at the same time, if, if you break your heart for every single species, you're going to be here a while writing on those many billions of cards yeah. for every species that has gone extinct. So, you know, I think the better way to look at that is just be glad you're on the team that won. About 74,000 years ago, there was this humongous volcanic eruption in Indonesia from this volcano called Mount Tobo. And basically it sent so much volcanic ash. We talked about this in the mass extinctions. You know what happens, people, when you get a big old volcano and you blow it up. You get a lot of a lot of bad stuff. Apparently, the changes and the stuff. effects and doing the basically what they did is they would have they modeled the the changes that happened to the world, and there would have been things like darkness for years and and just mm. crazy temperatures in some places and super cold temperatures after for for tens of you know decades, and it was estimated that the human yeah. population dropped to only a couple thousand. In the whole world. That's nuts. And it's kind of weird because if we only went down to a couple thousand, does that mean that we're like heavily inbred? (laughs) That's, yes is the correct answer. (laughs) If we look at that again, when did, so yeah, they didn't actually die off then. They, they, uh, and, and the Denisovans kicked about until about say 40 or 30,000 years ago. In fact, yeah. the Denisovans lasted even longer. You said 15,000 years yeah. ago. So that Mount Tobo yeah, yeah. Uh, event happens and humans are almost completely wiped out. Were Neanderthals heavily affected? I actually don't know. I'd imagine so. You know what? Like, if, if, if we go back thinking about everything we talked about, they're pro- they were probably better off than Homo sapiens would have been. Like, Neanderthals and Denisovans, they're just sturdy. That that's what they were. They were big, sturdy creatures that were hard to kill. The biggest thing I think in their way in that situation would be getting food. You know, because if you're saying that all the Homo sapiens were dying, I imagine that most things were dying. You know, I'd say there was a, a significant amount of things that were going, and especially if there were like decades of darkness, you're obviously going to have a huge loss in the herbivore population anything that feeds on plants and then to be honest Mm. most of the things that you hunt they're all herbivores you know predators don't hunt that many predators it's really cool dude it's really cool but humans survived and we've managed to completely wreck the place but you know what we've had fun while we did it (laughs) (laughs) of the podcast we hope you enjoyed your time if you're feeling generous and you're not completely skimped why don't you give us some money join our Patreon join our Join our Patreon. 
join our bay.